Hello everyone, this is Jim Lucy, Editor-in-Chief for Electrical Wholesaling and Electrical Marketing with the August 7th, 2022 edition of the Today's Electrical Economy podcast sponsored by Champion Fiberglass. The company began producing epoxy fiberglass condiment fittings in 1988 and in 1989 developed the first conduit from epoxy resins that had flame resistance and low smoke characteristics. This meant the most stringent codes and specifications. In this podcast, we will look at some large construction projects that recently either broke ground or hit the drawing boards in the past few months, and then check out the latest population data for the fastest growing counties in the United States. We'll also be looking at some weekly economic indicators that can give you a sense of where the U.S. economy will be headed in the next few weeks and months. These five weekly indicators are inertial unemployment claims at the state level, rail freight car traffic, the Baker Hughes rig count, oil prices, and copper prices. Our thanks again to Champion Fiberglass for sponsoring our Today's Electrical Economy series for 2023. For the week ending July the 29th, the advanced figure for seasonally adjusted initial claims was 227,000, and that's an increase of 6,000 from the previous week's unrevised level of 221,000. The four-week moving average was 228,250, a decrease of 5,500 from the previous week's unrevised average of 233,750. The U.S. unemployment rate for July decreased a fraction of percent to 3.5 percent. For the week ending July the 29th, we had five states that had some fairly sizable decreases in their number of unemployment claims. Ohio led the pack with a decrease of 2,958 claims. They are sitting at 18,500 claims filed. California saw a decrease of 2,386, now sitting at 41,341 claims filed. Georgia had a decrease of 15. 193, now sitting at 6,044. Texas saw a decrease of 1,162, and it filed 14,336. New York had a decrease of 864 claims, and now it has 14,171 claims through the week of July the 29th. The five states with the most claims filed for the week of July 29th were Missouri, which saw an increase of 2,458, up to 5,028 claims filed. Illinois saw an increase of 657 claims and now has 8,218 claims filed. New Jersey for the week saw an increase of 598 claims and now has 8,448 claims filed. Iowa saw an increase of 476 files of claims and now has 2,172 in the most recent data. Texas saw an increase of 377 claims filed and for the week had 2,772 claims filed. An interesting leading economic indicator for the overall economy is freight rail traffic. It's a measure of the amount of raw materials and finished goods being shipped by rail. The best source for this data is the American Association of Railroads, or AAR. It publishes this data weekly at www.aar.org. Total U.S. weekly rail traffic was 483,481 carloads and intermodal units. That is down 2.6% compared with the same week last year. It is solidly above the weekly average of 165,464 coloads and intermodal units. AOR Senior Vice President John T. Gray had this to say about the results in the most recent press release. As the economy goes, so goes rail traffic, and we are seeing that with the mixed results across volumes being affected by larger varying market conditions. The three non-July 4th weeks in July were the three highest volume intermodal weeks of the year, and carloads of chemicals rose in July for the first time in almost a year. However, at the same time, July was exceptionally weak for grain car loadings. July rail volumes are also affected by Independence Day closures, so we are cautious to put too much stock in this month's results. However, there are reasons for both optimism and caution. For the week ending July the 29th, nine of the carload commodity categories tracked by AOR saw so carload gains compared with July 2022. These categories included motor vehicles and parts, which were up 13.1%, crushed stone, sand, and gravel up 7.5%, and primary metal products, which were up 10.3%. The commodity groups that saw declines in July were from last year included grain, which was down 21%, coal down 2.2%, and pulp and paper products down 9.1%. If you track drilling activity for oil and gas, you're probably familiar with the Baker Hughes recount. This tracks the oil and gas rigs that are operating. The data is available by state, by basin and nationally at www.rigcount.bakerhughes.com. This slide gives you a good idea of the largest oil and gas deposits. It really gives you a sense of just how many of the large oil plays are in Texas and Oklahoma. 
and how big an area the Marcellus gas region covers in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and parts of West Virginia. There continues to be some pretty pronounced declines in the Baker Hughes rig count. Through last week, the count is down 89 rigs compared to August 2022, and that is an 11.7% decline. Texas is down almost 12%, and almost half of all rigs that shut down nationally were in Texas. The Permian Basin is down 16 rigs year over year, and the Eagle Ford Basin is down 13 rigs. The Haynesville Bossier Basin, which straddles Texas and Louisiana, is down 24 rigs compared to last year. Because of the huge size of the Texas's Permian Basin, the Baker Hughes rig count tracks that basin very closely, as you can see in this slide. The, the gray line is the overall U.S. rig count. The orange line is the Permian Basin. And the Eagle Ford, which is the second largest oil basin, is the blue line at the bottom. The Baker Hughes rig count does not track that as closely, but as you can see in this slide from 2019 to 2023, it's, it's pretty close to a direct overlay of the uh, Baker Hughes rig count for the U.S. and the Baker Hughes rig count for the Permian Basin. If you listen to CNBC or any of the other financial channels, uh, you can see that financial journals are tracking the recent increase in oil prices quite closely. Oil prices have increased steadily since the end of June, and when they were for WTI or West Texas Intermediate Crude, were under $70 per barrel. On August 7th, the price for a barrel of this WTI was at $82.16. The average price of a WTI barrel is now $75.12. Oil prices are now above the year-to-date average. Economists like to call copper pricing Dr. Copper because it's a leading economic indicator for future activity since copper is used in so many industries. The construction industry is among the leading markets because of its use in wire and cable and copper plumbing pipe. Cognos copper prices as of August the 4th had dropped slightly to $3.86 per pound. That's down a bit from last week, but they still do appear to be creeping above the $3.90 range in what may be a slow but steady move to eventually top $4 per pound again. One of the best sources for construction forecasts is the Dodge Construction Network. While it expects overall con commercial construction to be flat through the rest of 2023, it does see some strength in large institutional projects. It re also has been reporting on a number of large commercial and institutional projects that either are now on the drawing boards or recently broke ground. One of the largest of these projects is the Matterhorn Express Pipeline in Texas. It's a 580-mile-long natural gas pipeline from the Permian Basin to Katy, Texas, near Houston. When complete, it will transport 2.5 billion cubic feet of natural gas per day to the Houston metropolitan area. It's expected to be complete in the third quarter of 2024. Let's take a look at some of the other large projects that recently made news. The largest project that Dodge shows breaking ground over the past couple of months is the JetBlue Terminal at JFK Airport. It's a $2.6 billion project that broke ground. There's been a number of other construction projects going on at JFK, so it sounds like a very busy place. Some of the other large projects were a $930 million wastewater treatment plant breaking ground in St. Louis. We had a life science park in Medford, Massachusetts, valued at $710 million, entered the planning stage back in June. A semiconductor plant breaking ground in Sherman, Texas, valued at $625 million. We had a large hospital project, Rochester, New York, breaking ground in June, $558 million. Some of the other interesting types of projects, we also had a large data center project breaking ground in that hot spot for, for data centers in Northern Virginia. The Old Potomac Church Data Center, $280 million in Stafford, Virginia. There's a number of other projects listed on the, sli on the slide, and you'll also be able to find a, a more complete list of, of construction projects breaking around in the next issue of Electrical Marketing. That is available for only $99 per year, and we do go to report regularly on the large construction projects in Electrical Marketing. A quick and easy way to identify the fastest growing local markets is population growth. The U.S. Census Department updates population data annually at the county, metro, state, and national level. The map on this slide shows you which counties gained or lost population in the last 10 years. The declines in upstate New York and through some parts of the industrial Midwest are notable. This map also clearly shows the move in population to the Sun Belt. Let's take a look at some of those counties that added or lost the most population over the, pe over the year, the past five years, and over the last 10 years. If you've been listening to our broadcast of the uh, Today's Electrical Economy, you've probably heard us talk about some of the larger, faster growing counties. And you'll really see some very familiar names in this listing on this slide. Uh, six of the fastest growing counties are in Texas, and three of them are in Florida. However, the fastest growing county, as measured by population growth over the past 10 years, 
the five-year period, and from 2021 to 2022, the most recent data is Maricopa County in Arizona, and that is the Phoenix Mesa Scottsdale area. Uh, last year alone, the last year the data was available, it gained 56,831 uh, residents. Uh, over the past five years, from 2017 to 2022, it gained over 200,000 residents. And if you look at the data from 2012 to 2022, it gained an astounding 603,359 new residents. Some of the other fast-growing counties, as we mentioned, many of them in Texas. We've got Harris County, that's in the Houston Metro. Collin County, that's in the Dallas Metro. Denton County, also in the Dallas Metro. Uh, moving down to Florida, Polk County in the Lakeland Winter Haven market in the center of the state, uh, and the Lee County, which is the Cape Crawl Fort Myers area. Also on our top 10 list is the uh, Fort Bend County that's in the Houston Metro, going back down to Florida in the Tampa Metro. There we've got Hillsborough County, and then San Antonio, Texas is not, comes in at number nine. That's the Bexar County, and another Houston County, Montgomery County, checks in in the number 10 spot. Last year, it gained 28,229 uh, in population. Uh, over the past 10 years, it's gained over 190,000. That just uh, blows my mind when you think of the number of people that are moving into some of these areas. It would appear that many of the counties that are shedding some of their, their population growth and moving into these fast-growing counties are some of the nation's largest cities. Los Angeles County, for instance, in California, over the past year alone, this population shrank 90,704. Over the past 10 years, its population is down over 210,000. A second on our list of the counties that are showing the big, biggest population decreases, Cook County, that's of course Chicago Metro. Over the past 10 years, it's down over 129,000 residents. And over the past year alone, it is down 68,000 residents. Some of the other cities that have lost large amounts of uh, folks are Baltimore, Detroit, Milwaukee, St. Louis, uh, New York, specifically the Bronx, and we've got Jackson, Mississippi on our top 10 list, uh, Cuyahoga County, which is in Cleveland, and down Louisiana, Caddo Paris in the Shreveport, Boss Air area. All losing, and this is all, if you look at this slide, they are all ranked by their population change over the past 10 years. I also like to take a look at the small counties that are growing fast. And the Census Department defines many of them as micropolitan counties because they have less than 50,000 in population, but have at least one urban cluster or at least 10,000 people. Number one on the Census Department's list over the past 10 years, five years, and one year is Bozeman, Montana, a beautiful place just north of the Yellowstone National Park. Over the past 10 years, it has, its population is, it is up 34.8%. It's gained over 32,000 residents. We've all, you can see a trend here if you look at some of the other foot places in the slide, some pretty beautiful places, and it's a kind of vacation area, I think, for many of the places that are gaining the most. We have Kalispell, Montana, up about 20,000 people in the past 10 years. Rexburg, Idaho, up 18,000. Hilo, Hawaii, up 17,000. So the other cities that gained significant amounts of population over the past 10 years were Heber, Utah, Center, excuse me, Cedar City, Utah, Pinehurst, Southern Pines, North Carolina, Granbury, Texas, and Williston, North Dakota, which is in the middle of the oil patch up there. This wraps up our podcast for today, and special thanks again to the folks from Champion Fiberglass for sponsoring the today's Electrical Economy podcast series for 2023. Please contact me if you have any questions on the data that we're presenting here, or if there's any other type of economic data you would like us to cover in these podcasts. Our next presentation will be on August 21st, and until then, be healthy, stay happy, hope you're staying cool, and it's, it's good. we're getting a little bit of a break in the weather in the Kansas City area, hope you're getting the same wherever you might be located. Again, I look forward to talking with you in two weeks. Take care.